Welcome. So tonight, uh, our speaker, Gary Huckleberry, has, he's probably one of the more uh, experienced individuals looking at agricultural features from ancient times. And he knows the Gila River, the Salt River, he's worked in the Tucson area, he's got a broad uh, overview and direct experience across that entire landscape. And last year our focus was on Tucson Underground and Phoenix Underground. This year we're trying to uh, expand and look at uh, you know, relationships out of those, those areas. So this is an opportunity to look at the uh, similarities and differences and different trajectories of these two areas. So Gary, I'll turn the floor over to you and uh, we'll get this underway. There will be an opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, as, as Gary finishes up. So I'll come back with a microphone and bring it out to you and you can ask questions a little later. Thanks again. <clears throat> thank you, Bill. And um, thank you everyone for, for coming out tonight. I'm always uh, humbled uh, when I see uh, a good turnout like this uh, for, uh, to come to a talk about dirt. Uh, and I am a geologist uh, by training. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a, well, they call a soft rock geologist. Uh, but I've been working in the, uh, with the archaeological community for, I hate to say it now, several decades uh, to try to better understand water control features uh, and uh, what they might mean, sort of the, the bigger picture. And um, I, I have the luxury of being able to work both in the Phoenix area and in the Tucson area. I, I lived down here in Tucson, but I was born and raised in Phoenix. I went to school at the U of A. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but there is a rivalry between <laughs> Pima County and Maricopa County. I'm not sure if you know about this. I like to read the letters to the uh, newspaper, you know, the Arizona Daily Star, where you hear sometimes people refer to those Phoenicians as self-absorbed hyper-capitalists. <laughs> and then I get the chance to go up to Phoenix and read the Arizona Republic, and they refer to us down here as uh, cactus-hugging socialists. <laughs> and some people take it pretty seriously, uh, and even there have been some who have um, suggested that Arizona south of the Gila River secede from the rest of the state of Arizona. <laughs> Viva Baja Arizona. Well, uh, there's, a, there's another rivalry that's a little more friendly, uh, a little milder, between the archaeologists up in Phoenix and, and then down here in Tucson, basically about who has the cooler archaeology. And uh, I will, I'll tell you right now, the answer is both places have pretty darn cool archaeology. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about just one small component of that archaeology, uh, mainly, again, focusing on the evidence for water control and, and agriculture uh, between the two areas, because there are, there are important differences, but there are similarities too. Uh, so I'll start, though, with uh, just a quick review, a timeline here for some of you who might not be familiar with the cultural history around here. I mean, we, some of the earliest evidence of humans in the southwest go back to about 14,000 years ago when the place around here looked quite different than it does today. And for the first 7,000 years of that or so, you know, people got by as foragers, hunting and gathering. But uh, eventually, we start to see the domestication of mainly plants in the Americas in different places. And the one that's most relevant to the Southwest is the domestication of maize. It's, you know it often as corn, but we, we call it maize, which started in southern Mexico uh, about 5500 BC and then worked its way north into the Southwest as early as um, thus far. We, we have it about 2100, maybe 2200 BC. And this represents um, a pretty uh, important change, called a hinge point in history, about how uh, people uh, basically made a living. Uh, and Tucson is fortunate enough to have a very complete record of quite a bit of that, that history. Now, different strategies were employed, uh, and still are employed, in the 
uh, production of crops. And for example, we might talk about dry farming and some probably some of the earliest um, uh, agriculture we see, particularly in the highlands, was this type of dry farming. Essentially, this is saying that you plant your crops in areas that get enough rainfall in summer, particularly in terms of maize, uh, to uh, produce a, um, a crop. And obviously, the higher in elevation you go, the more rainfall you get in the summertime. But of course, you reach a sort of uh, limit because then it becomes too high, it's too cold, and your frost, your, your frost-free growing season is too short. But nonetheless, uh, dry farming is one way to uh, approach this. But down in the lowlands, where it's drier and hotter, you've got to have some sort of supplemental moisture to grow something like maize. So you have other strategies. Uh, one might be what we call flood water farming. You plant your crops in an area that naturally floods. You don't have to really modify anything on the landscape. Well, you, might, you might make low earthen mounds or something of that sort. But there are different examples of flood water farming that we've seen uh, uh, both archaeologically and ethnographically, uh, including groups on the lower Colorado River uh, just planting on the margins of floodplains so that the river, when it rises gradually in the s late spring and summer from snow melt in the Rockies, it inundates that area, irrigates it, and the river recedes, and they can raise their crop. Another one is very common, uh, for example, up in the Colorado Plateau and in the Sonoran Desert, actually, we call sort of flood water farming in small washes uh, where the water kind of, it might be confined in a, 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 a draw or maybe a, a small canyon and then open up and then that's where you plant your field. So that's a, a very common method as well. It requires not a lot of labor to, to do this. It's, it's not a, an intensive form of agriculture. Uh, but there are other forms where you do have a much more, uh, a greater investment in the landscape. Uh, and that would be the canal irrigation, where you actually are now playing a role in modifying how water flows on the surface, uh, particularly by excavating uh, uh, artificial channels to divert water out of uh, streams or springs and towards areas where you plant your crops. Uh, this ha is, a, as I said, a very, we call, intensive form of agriculture, and that has implications that go beyond just diet about what's growing. When we start seeing people building canals and, um, uh, and growing, uh, growing crops through canal irrigation, uh, these canals require quite a bit of labor, not only to construct, but to maintain, so we have more labor. Uh, we are able to increase the amount of food that is produced. That leads to greater population, which in terms often leads to greater socioeconomic interaction and maybe social stratification. Uh, so there are social cultural implications to how you use water on the landscape, how you, how you grow your crops, uh, not only in terms of your, your, the social aspects of it, but also in terms of the ecology. You now are having a greater, eco you have a greater ecological footprint. And you are not only diverting the natural flow of water into areas where it otherwise would not go, you're also modifying the soils as well. So scientists, um, archaeologists, anthropologists, geographers, they're interested in this sort of transition to intensive agriculture. And uh, because of these other social ecological type of implications and here in Tucson and in Phoenix we have a deep record of that change uh, that makes the area of interest to scientists. So I will demonstrate uh, tonight some of um, the environmental differences which play an important role in why we have differences in the agriculture, prehistoric agriculture of the two places and then also discuss some of the differences and sim similarities between these examples of, of agriculture and water control. And then I'll touch at the very end, does this have any relevance uh, today? Um, you know, beyond understanding what p uh, our, you know, this great heritage of the past, can we learn from some of this information to provide context to some of the problems we face today? So let's start with sort of the environmental aspects and it's particularly starting here with Tucson. So the main water course in Tucson, although sometimes we might forget that today, uh, is the Santa Cruz River. And it has a catchment of uh, about 3,500 square miles. It starts up in the mountains outside Patagonia or Canelo. It flows south into Sonora, turns around, does a U-turn, comes back into Arizona. And I should say that 3,500 mile square mile watershed is that above Tucson. Obviously, it continues beyond Tucson and joins the Gila River, but at Tucson, 
about 3,500 square miles. Most of that watershed is low elevation, does not accumulate a significant snowpack, and that's important because uh, the river within Tucson uh, historically was mainly intermittent. You had some reaches that were perennial that flowed year round, particularly in areas where, uh, particularly where you had shallow bedrock, like at the base of a mountain. Thus, this was ended up being the, the starting point for the town of Tucson. And then also maybe at San Javier del Bac, another place where you have shallow bedrock where water came up. But in other reaches, it was ephemeral. It only flowed during the, the rainy seasons, let's say. But you still had um, dependable water in those perennial reaches, and you had this pretty lush riparian zone along uh, the creek, uh, um, particularly along those perennial reaches. But then you had a series of, of important environmental changes in the late 1800s. Some of them, I think, were human uh, caused, some of it probably natural. We had a series of large floods that caused the Santa Cruz River to downcut into its floodplain, creating what we call arroyos, steep sided gullies, channels. This is a big flood in the 1890s right below a mountain, Sentinel Peak, uh, near downtown. And this actually started uh, at what is known as Sam Hughes Ditch, um, a canal that was dug in the floodplain that was rather deep. And then we had a series of really large floods, and it sort of took that ditch and it migrated upstream, and it resulted in a very long, continuous arroyo. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail about, you know, what causes arroyos. Uh, you know, we did have extensive arroyo cutting throughout the southwest, not just the Santa Cruz River in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but we also had them going back several thousands of years. We know that. We can see these ancient arroyos in the walls uh, in the subsurface of the, of the floodplains. Uh, this, however, certainly humans probably played a role, perhaps um, overgrazing as well. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, topic in itself, but it kind of shows you some of the challenges of practicing irrigation uh, along some of these, um, these desert water courses. Today, of course, the river is mostly dry because after the downcutting, we had further uh, groundwater pumping, and now the Santa Cruz River is mostly channelized um, and, uh, and dry, except for a few places where we release water at uh, water treatment plants effluent. Uh, we have uh, the, the arroyos, sort of a mixed, sort of a mixed uh, good and bad, because the arroyos obviously tore out uh, canals and farms and bridges, but it certainly provided a nice glimpse into the floodplain stratigraphy, which is what I like, a glimpse into the past. And so we, we, we sort of know quite a bit about the Santa Cruz floodplain because of some of these arroyos, although most of those arroyo exposures now have been covered up with soil cement for water control uh, and for flood protection. Uh, but nonetheless, quite a bit is known about the floodplain. And then we've also had some pretty deep archaeological excavations to sort of look at those layers of flood deposits and see that we have fine-grained sediments and organic soils that date back 5,000 years. And within that 5,000 years is when we see the development of agriculture, and it is contained within this sequence of deposits in the Santa Cruz floodplain. That is pretty, that is pretty cool. Now let's turn to the Phoenix area, and their main water course is the Salt River, and it is a much larger water course. It is a, um, well, historically it was a perennial river, and it has a much larger watershed, but it's not just the size of the watershed. It's the fact that that watershed is at a much higher elevation, extending up into the Mogollon Rim and, and White Mountains. It develops a pretty thick snowpack, or at least it used to, and that snowmelt would then provide a steady base flow that would provide, and still does more or less, a about a million acre feet of water to the city of Phoenix, to the metropolitan area of Phoenix. So an acre foot, an acre, one foot deep of water. So like an acre is what, about 1.3 football fields, acre water, one million provided naturally. Of course, now the, the river is dammed in several places and then the water is diverted into canals. So when you go to Phoenix today and you look down there, you see an empty, except at Tempe where they have these artificial lakes, you pretty much have an empty, dry, channelized river. But at one time it was quite, uh, quite uh, wet and lush, again with a, a pretty rich riparian corridor, uh, but that, uh, that changed with upstream diversions uh, in the 1900s. By about 1939, I think, the river was, was largely dry in the Phoenix area, but it would have some big floods because of that large catchment area, but because of that snowpack that would build up, particularly in the wintertime, if you had uh, a large snowpack and then all of a sudden sort of a warm, 
uh, incursion of air, kind of like what happened this week here in, in Arizona where the snow level jumped up high. If you have a heavy snowpack and then rain on top of that, it releases a lot of water. And some of the biggest floods on the Salt River before they built the dams were in the winter, such as in 1890 here. This is a picture of the uh, railroad crossing at Tempe. Uh, 1905, another a big one. This, this led to the, the construction of several dams, the first one being Roosevelt Dam in 1911. But this, this river would flood, and it would flood seasonally. This, this is an exceptionally large flood, but you would have seasonal floods where the river would rise, and then in the summertime it would be much lower. It still flow, but it was much lower. So it has a, a, a wide fluctuation in what's called discharge or runoff, and that's a pretty important characteristic because that's in that that creates challenges if you're trying to control water and bring it off for irrigation, uh, which has which uh, the um, indigenous farmers have done there for quite some time. Uh, just to take a look here, 1937, where one of the last remaining uh, flowing stretches of the river was between Tempe Butte here, that's that other school, um, flying at Papago Butte. So right here you have shallow bedrock. This, this reach flowed for quite a bit, but I show this because the river is quite different than the Santa Cruz River. It's a wide braided channel, a lot of sand and gravel, channels that branched and reconnected. Again, not uh, more challenging for water control probably than the Santa Cruz River. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, people were able to do this for, for a long time. Now, because this is not a river conducive to arroyo cutting, we don't have as much information on the floodplain stratigraphy as we do the Santa Cruz River. There haven't been that many excavations, deep excavations in the Santa Cruz, excuse me, Salt River floodplain. So we don't have as much knowledge on the age of the deposits. But what we, what we have seen thus far is most of these deposits that are fine-grained, where you're likely to find prehistoric agricultural features, uh, is younger. And we only dates back maybe two or 3,000 years. You go below that, and you're in these high-energy gravels and cobbles and stuff. So the deposits here are a little bit younger. They don't go far back in time as the ones in the Santa Cruz River. And as a geologist, I think that has a lot, that's a big part of why we don't see as early canals uh, in Phoenix as we do here in the Tucson area. So let's turn to the archaeology now, uh, it's starting back here with Tucson. So yeah, we have this floodplain with this tremendous geological and archaeological record. We have some of the earliest evidence of agriculture in the southwest here in Tucson. Maize dated with radiocarbon to about 2100 BC. This was, I think, from uh, the Las Capas site, which uh, you probably know it as the Tres Rios water treatment plant, Ina Road and the freeway. Uh, that is a very well-studied site, a very rich site, with some of the earliest agriculture we know of in the southwest preserved quite nicely, as you'll see in a moment. But some of these other sites along the Santa Cruz River also have early evidence of agriculture going back long before the ceramic period, okay, as people are making that transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. We don't think it happened overnight. It's not people all of a sudden maize comes up from Mexico and they say, I'm no longer hunting and gathering, I'm just going to grow corn. It was a gradual process, and there's still debate about how rapid or slow that process was. But nonetheless, by 2100 BC, they're growing corn, they're growing maize in the floodplain, the Santa Cruz River, probably not using canals right off the bat, maybe some sort of floodwater farming, maybe what we call water table farming. But, uh, but, but the canals come a little bit later. Now, what is the evidence for the canals? What do they look like? All right, so this is where the geology comes in because these things are buried. They're mainly defined by stratigraphy, layers of sediment. So in this picture, you actually have two canals. One was dug and then another it filled with flood sediments, uh, sands of the Rito Creek. And then another one was dug right along its similar alignment. And then it was used, and then it got filled with flood sediments from Rieto Creek. And then it was forgotten, and then later a house was built on top of it by the Hoacom about 2,000 years later. How do we know the ages? Well, we dated these canals with a combination of um, radiocarbon, which you probably know of, and then another method, maybe you're not, it's a geological method called luminescence dating of sediment. We can actually date the sand grains. So this is, these are some of the early canals dating about 800 to 700 BC that we find buried in the subsurface. So I imagine some of you right now are saying, how do you know those are canals? Why couldn't those be 
natural channels. And if you only have one exposure, sometimes it's very difficult to, to know for sure. In this case, we were able to trace these canals and show that they had a fairly uniform uh, channel or geometry as you go downstream. Uh, they often have clean out deposits on the side where they were used, filled with sediment, and then cleaned out. Uh, that, that usually kind of is an is a indication that it's a cultural phenomenon, not a natural phenomenon. Sometimes these canals also, most times these canals, don't follow the maximum slope. So the river follows a maximum slope. These canals are going at a lesser slope. Natural channels really don't do that for very long, very, very far. Um, so here's an example of an arroyo exposure of a prehistoric canal. Uh, and it is a canal that came off the Santa Cruz River and brought water out of the floodplain by following a lesser gradient than the river onto the, uh, the kind of the foot slopes of the Tucson Mountains near Silver Bell Road and Cortero Farms Road. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, a closer shot of that. Um, the sediments in the canal are different color. It's because they're coming off the Santa Cruz River. Everything else around it are red sediments coming off the Tucson Mountains. That doesn't happen naturally. So these are kind of sometimes the clues we can use to identify a canal. I wish I could say that arroyo exposure is still there. It's not. It's been covered in soil cement. Uh, I said if you have one exposure, sometimes it's tricky to know if indeed it is a canal. Uh, I show this out here um, because this was recently discovered in the Santa Cruz River floodplain, although uh, the sediments here are mainly from, which where the Rito joins the Santa Cruz, so most of the sediments are from the Rito. But uh, this feature right here has sands that come from the Santa Cruz River. They have a different mineralogy. There was charcoal in it. We could radiocarbon date that charcoal, and it came back between 1600 and 1400 BC. If that date reflects that channel, and that channel is a canal, that's the oldest canal in North America. But it's one exposure. So could it be a natural channel? I can't rule it out. It's improbable. I mean, how do you get Santa Cruz River sediment in a s one little channel up onto, you know, Rito Creek uh, alluvium? Charcoal, charcoal occurs naturally. And then the charcoal could actually, you know, when you radiocarbon date charcoal, you're dating the death of the plant. What if the plant died and the charcoal laid there for several hundred years and then got washed into this canal, you're actually dating not the canal, but an event that occurred 300 years before it. So the date may be too old than it is. More work needs to be done. But you can kind of get the idea of, of some of these things are very subtle and, and what we have to do to try to demonstrate their age and, and function. All right, you think canals are hard to identify in the uh, subsurface. Try finding the fields they irrigated. Uh, it really wasn't until about 30 years ago that people actually started finding these pre-European contact canals beneath the surface of the floodplain because they were kind of subtle. and We didn't really kind of know what to look for. But then we started finding them, but we never could find the fields. We would infer the location of the fields based on maybe maize pollen, but stratigraphically very difficult. And that changed about 10 years ago with excavations done by desert archaeology at Las Capas, where uh, they were not only doing conventional excavations with trenches, but they would come down in sort of plan view. And you can see these polygonal patterns highlighted with spray paint on the edge. These polygons are field cells that are about 1,000 years old. This is, these are the fields that are being irrigated by those canals that we saw earlier. Uh, to get an idea of how deep, in this case, these are, look at the backhoe. The backhoe is well below the, the modern surface. So it's no wonder these things haven't been found until, until recently. Um, a good uh, friend and colleague of mine, Fred Niles, who's been looking at these things longer than I have, we, once we realized in plan view where these things are and then looked at them in side view, we realized we've been looking at these things for a long time and didn't know it, didn't recognize them. Now we have a little bit better idea what they look like and we're star starting to find them, including recently in Phoenix. Uh, we found some, uh, some fields that are not as old as these, but nonetheless, we're actually starting to see the fields. So that's pretty cool because that's part of the whole agricultural system, both the canals and the fields. Uh, about a mile or two upstream from Las Capas, where Sunset Road, the new bridge connecting Silver Bell Road and I-10, uh, during, during that road construction, before that we did ar archaeology. This was done by SWCA, an archaeological firm here in Tucson. And here in this case, just because of lucky geological preservation, not only were we able to identify the fields, we were able to remove layers of sediment from them and expose them in three-dimensional view where you can actually see the berms and the rectangular grid 
and it gets even better. The preservation was so good, we found human footprints that are about 2,800 years old and canine paw prints. Don't know if they're domesticated dog or coyote, but nonetheless, uh, w in the fields themselves. It's seldom you get a chance to see something so well preserved in, in something that old where you, like, you're taken back in time. These people walking in the mud uh, in these fields right here in the Santa Cruz River floodplain. Well, because Tucson has such a rich archaeological record going back so far, uh, that's from what we can tell, fairly continuous of agriculture, uh, that's part of the reason why we had the, re the distinction of being an official UNESCO World City of Gastronomy. I don't know how many of you knew that or not. Um, and it's in part because of this rich record, plus some of the later Spanish and Anglo and other ethnic um, influences, that we have this designation. So um, I think that's, that's worthy of bragging about, sure. So what does Phoenix have? <laughs> well, <coughs> we'd like to say we have the oldest agriculture down here, oldest canals and stuff. Phoenix has the yeah. biggest because they have the Salt River, which was a much bigger river. And they have an incredible a uh, series of canal systems that uh, tied together several villages. This is a map from about A.D. 1200, so much later in time, um, that occurs in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Over 300 miles of these canals have been mapped in this area alone. In Tucson, we get short little segments of canals that we find in the subsurface. These are canals that we've mapped. Some of them extend 20 miles in length uh, and extend well beyond the floodplain of the Salt River. Uh, an incredible, incredible record uh, that, that has been known about for some time. It's been known about some time because a lot of these canals were visible at the surface, that's how big they were, uh, when the first Anglo settlers arrived in the 1800s and they could see these things. In fact, the whole town, the name of Phoenix is an, based on this idea of an ancient civilization that was gone, and now a new one would rise up from the ashes, like the Phoenix bird, right? So, yeah. Um, so who built these canals? This is later than some of the stuff I was showing you earlier. Well, these are what we call the Hohokam. Who are the, who are the Hohokam? Well, if, if we step back a bit, I mean, the, the Hohokam are descendants probably of the people who built the early canals I was showing you that long before the ceramic period. And what happened to speed through time is, well, people started growing more food, canals got bigger, um, they started uh, diversifying the crops. You start, you know, you had maize, you had beans, you had um, squash, you, uh, you had cotton, uh, various gourds. Um, and then uh, as uh, the amount of, uh, as production increased, canals got larger, you had larger populations. You had the development eventually of ceramics, didn't have that before. Uh, and with uh, ceramics, you could store food uh, which then leads to exchange and trade, which that in turn uh, leads to um, perhaps even uh, more socioeconomic socio interaction and population growth. And so by the time you get to about AD 450, we have this distinct, what we call material culture, this, this, this group with very distinct types of architecture and ceramics that we call Hohokam. All right. A culture is more than the material items they make, but this is in archaeology, we work with material items. These are the Hohokam. And you probably are familiar with that term. Red on buff pottery, very, uh, very characteristic trait. Uh, they lived in pit house villages, and then a little bit later there was a change, and, and they had uh, above ground masonry structures, adobe. Uh, they had not only residential architecture, they had, ball they had what we call public architecture, such as ball courts, shown up there in the upper right. And then, and then later we had things known as platform mounds towards the latter part of their period. Um, largely uh, cremation burial complexes, although that also changed later to, to inhumations um, and or combination of the two. And then last but not least, uh, canal systems. In fact, many people, when we talk about Hohokam in the Southwest, people think of them as the great canal builders. But they are not the first ones, I and mean, they're much later in the game, but because the, we, kn we know so much more about their canal systems than these earlier ones that we have deeply buried in the floodplain. So as I said, when the first settlers came into the Phoenix area, uh, 16, or excuse me, 1860s, 1870s, a lot of these were still visible on the surface. 
Uh, and, uh, but by 1930, which is when this photograph was taken, over 99% of them were already plowed over, okay, destroyed. This is one last little segment of a canal known as Woodbury's North Canal because uh, an archaeologist named Richard Woodbury excavated a segment of it a little bit upstream. Uh, which was still preserved in 1930, but most of these canals were gone by the time they could document a lot of them through photography. This is one of the few places where you can still see Woodbury's North and another canal next to it, or any large Hohokam canal within the city of Phoenix. This is called Park of the Four Waters. And if you see in the background there, you're right off the east end of the north runway of Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. So if you're flying into the city and landing from the east, look off the right side of the window, and you look down and you'll see this. This is where the, where the canals are near their head gates, so they're, they're pretty big. And uh, just for scale, th there's a people walking them. You could drive a large truck down the axis of these channels. These are the largest uh, pre-contact canals in North America. Okay, so that's, that's something to brag about. They're, they're pretty impressive. But as I said, most of them now um, are, are gone. And so that might lead to the question, well, how do you know there are over 300 miles of them if they didn't get a chance to document all of them before they were destroyed? The good news is the, uh, they still are preserved, at least the middle and lower dimensions, below the surface. And sometimes we can use things like historic aerial photography to actually map out some of these things. So I don't know if you can make out these dark patterns here and here and then these lines in between. Those are Hohokam canals. That, are, that show up in these fallow fields from the 1960s in Tempe because the fill is a, a probably a finer texture, holds moisture, and so it appears darker on the photography. When those fields are in, in crop and being you know, uh, covered in plants, you can't see them. But if you get just the right moisture conditions and they're fallow, sometimes these things pop out. So we've mapped a lot of canals using some of the historic photography, but sometimes you can even use modern Google Earth and see some of this. So this is um, a current Google Earth image uh, out in West Phoenix. This is part of the, the new freeway they're building, the South Mountain Freeway uh, 202. So when we, if we're driving from Tucson to LA, we won't have to go through downtown Phoenix. We'll be able to bypass that south of South Mountain and come up and join I-10 out around 59th Avenue. But anyway, this is about Lower Buckeye Road and 59th Avenue. This is the work we were doing trying to identify canals coming through. When we were doing work out here, which is what these trenches are, done by Westland, which is a, a local archaeological um, uh, firm, uh, we, you see these streaks here. This one comes across, and we actually hit it. You can see the trenches that we traced it. Here's another one we missed. <laughs> it went between these trenches. And it's just Murphy's Law. You, know? you put all these trenches, these north-south trenches, and they just kind of sneak in through them. Sometimes you, that happens. Here's where they split. Notice this is a fallow field, but they don't show up. For whatever reason, the moisture in that field, because it was irrigated maybe long before this photograph was taken, it doesn't show up. Now, we actually had the opportunity to go to that red spot and see what the canal looks like. And the canal is right there, and it has this dark clay that you can just kind of imagine holding moisture, and that might show up uh, darker on an aerial photograph. The same field, though, had something that I've never seen before until uh, just this last year or two years ago. This is really interesting. Uh, this, is a, this photograph was taken by Westland by a drone, but it ends up on Google Earth. You can see it, you can see it as well. This is alfalfa that is kind of gone to seed and is just sort of slowly drying out. You see those, those lines? Those lines are the canals. And, and so it's like, well, why, you know, now they're white. What is that? That's where the um, alfalfa is more desiccated, more dried out and dead. It, why? I don't know. Maybe the clay in the channel, uh, the canal channel, holds on the moisture more, and so the, the, the alfalfa is more drought stressed. But these are crop marks. These are the crop marks you see in Britain, you know, where during droughts, all of a sudden you start seeing these, these hinges and these moats and stuff. Well, <laughs> we actually can see, in, 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 very rarely, but the uh, crop marks showing some of these prehistoric canals, which is uh, pretty cool. So, yeah, sometimes we can use remote sensing photography and stuff to map out these canals, but you know where we get most of that, the, the, the true information is by looking at the dirt, by, by excavating these. As I said, most of the upper dimensions have long been plowed over, but the middle to lower parts are still preserved. We can use those dimensions to try to figure out um, how much water they carried, what might be the potential irrigable area. 
Uh, the estimates aren't always precise because uh, we have problems sometimes knowing the depth of the water um, within the canal at any one time, but it gives us sort of a, a ballpark estimate, which is useful um, to understand these systems. And then we also look at these deposits to help us understand how much work it was not only to build these canals, but to maintain them. And I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you an example uh, with a study that was done, again, near Park of the Four Waters, but in this area where the red rectangle is. Uh, it's an area that desert archaeology uh, recently had a chance to excavate. It's an area where the Phoenix Skytrain uh, parking area is, where you take the light rail and then take the Phoenix Skytrain to the Terminal 4. The Woodbury's North Canal, what you see here, um, extends down into this area. In fact, that photograph I showed from 1930, several slides back, is in that same parcel. So we said, oh, great, we'll get a chance to revisit Woodbury's North Canal and use more modern techniques than Woodbury had when he excavated it um, here at Park of the Four Waters. So we did that, and lo and behold, there's more than just uh, the Woodbury's North. Woodbury's North is this canal here, but we saw a series of major canals, plus these distribution branching canals. Uh, we also saw some architecture, some um, field houses, uh, and we also were able to see um, evidence of what we call Salt River floods, <laughs> big floods that came in and really caused havoc on these canals, much like the historic floods in the Salt River did in the late 1800s. So here is Woodbury's North Canal as it is seen today, all the top of it is gone, but the fill of it, you had some sediments down here which were sediments that represent when it was being used, but the middle to upper part was all this real sandy uh, material with chunks of clay and silt, clearly a very turbulent high velocity flow of water that is a Salt River flood that came through there and blew out the head gates on this canal and filled this alignment with sediment going for several miles. At that point, they walked away from it, which is interesting because there are other canals in that same parcel where that thing happened and they just cleaned them out and reused them or they dug another canal parallel to it. For whatever reason, you know, this one, you know, they didn't rebuild it. And what's interesting is the age of this thing. You know, we use radiocarbon and luminescence dating, but this canal we found out was very late. It was the last one they built within this large system in this part of Phoenix. We know that because we got lucky with a polychrome ceramic that was actually in a, a, a headgate structure on the side of the canal for one of the distribution canals that got blown out by the flood. This we know was produced in the 1300s. And so this flood came in in the 1300s towards the end of the Hohokam period. All right, so the Hohokams st were starting to decrease in population. There was a decline in the 1300s. By 1450, from what we can tell in the archaeological record, they're gone. We still don't know why. But the hypothesis, one of the hypotheses had been for some time now, an increase in flooding. We have tree ring records that suggest there were more floods in the 1300s, particularly the late 1300s, and this could have stressed them. It indeed may have stressed them, and this may be one of these floods. But what's interesting is that the earlier canals that we see in this parcel have similar floods, but they just rebuilt them. So something changed in the in the late 1300s that we still don't know, but they didn't seem to have the ability to, to bounce back and, and, and fix it. But nonetheless, you get an idea, these flood deposits, that these canals, they required more work to maintain than to originally construct them. And so they're very labor intensive, very labor intensive, but they increase productivity, so it's a trade-off. What else do we know about the Hohokam up in Phoenix, which is pretty interesting? Well, this is, this is cool. I mean, you know, I talked about the Hohokam eventually coming to an end, and we still don't know why, but when I think of them, I mean, I think of, the, of a society that lived for a thousand years, and they didn't just do canal irrigation on big rivers, they actually moved into what I call non-riverine areas uh, along smaller drainages like Cave Creek and Awa Fria, if you, know, if you know the Phoenix area, Awa Fria River, Queen Creek. This was a study done by a company called Logan Simpsons along Cave Creek in far north Phoenix, where you had these interesting patches of fine sediment that, co that correspond with Hohokam sites along Cave Creek. And it's like, what are these patches of sediment? They, they look to be uh, made by the Hohokam. How, do, how does that work, and why would they do that? So the Sonora Boulevard, a, a new highway was being built that cuts through that one that's circled in red, giving us a chance to take a look at this, what we call a silt field. 
where it's about, uh, good Lord, about 1,400 feet long, 450 feet wide. It had stone alignments and it had a canal connecting to it. But it was fine textured sediment in a setting where the soils are naturally very gravelly. Uh, essentially what you're seeing is on the left is the natural soil. On the right is the soil associated with that site. They were not only tapping into these smaller drainages, they were producing soil favorable for agriculture and irrigating it with the floods that periodically came down Cave Creek. Okay, so that's a human modified soil. How would they trap sediment? How would that be done? We, don't we see rock alignments in them, but we think it's a combination of, of, of barriers made of rock and vegetation, perhaps even what we call living fence rows, such as this picture here from northern Mexico, where some farmers still have these. When the summer rains come and it floods, they capture that sediment, and it helps recharge nutrients in the fields, and it creates finer textured sediments that have greater water holding capacity greater uh, cation exchange, nutrient exchange, makes for a more fertile field where they can sustain those th that agriculture. We think that's probably what was going on at Cave Creek. So the Hohokam were quite adaptive to their environment, which always makes me sort of wonder you know, why after a thousand years did it finally come to an end? I, we don't know. Another example of adaptation away from the big rivers where this red circle is, is near the, the modern town of Queen Creek. So this is a, a, a large Hohokam site that was occupied for several centuries called Posos de Sanoki. And it's on the southern slope of the Santan Mountains. So this is an area where you cannot get canal water from the Gila or the Salt. It's just you, you have to bring water up slope. You can't do it. So these are villages that, were, that, peop, that the Hohokam lived in year round with no perennial water. How did they do that? They had to somehow harvest what little water that, that, that was out there uh, during, the, during the rainy seasons. They couldn't tap into the groundwater, too deep in this area, even historically before they started pumping, too deep. So interestingly enough, this site, long time, it, it, for up until the 1970s, it had this weird looking mound. And um, it's sort of horseshoe shaped. Um, there's a historic sort of uh, ditch next to it, or not ditch, but uh, cattle tank next to it. That's this, that's that. But this is the thing. When they did the mapping, the U.S. Geological Survey, it was still on the surface and showed up as a contour. By 1970s, it was bulldozed uh, and leveled. And so we weren't sure if it was uh, maybe a ball court, Hohokam ball court, or maybe it was a water catchment structure. Well, the, um, the development, or excuse me, the extension of Riggs Road uh, in Queen Creek provided an opportunity to take a look at this. And this was work done by a couple companies, Jacobs uh, Engineering and Logan Simpson. And we had a chance to dig into this thing. And it was big. And, and, and it was not a ball court because the sediments, again, the dirt, I say, never lies. You know, these are water line sediments in a pond that was there year round, did not dry. It's a year round body of water. It was a, it was a reservoir that harvested rainwater off the Santan Mountains. It held over 300,000 gallons when it was first constructed. It filled up with sediment through time. And it had a small canal coming off the, um, the, uh, the mountain, get that there, uh, that fed right into it. We could trace it out in this linear corridor. That's pretty cool. But uh, this, by the way, is the largest Hohokam reservoir we've seen yet in the Phoenix area. So we're still finding new stuff, uh, which is pretty exciting, even with what we call contract archaeology, salvage archaeology. But the, uh, the other thing was, is how old is it? I'll be darned, we got lucky again on this, if I can get this going. There we go. We found another decorated piece of pottery, this time at the bottom of it, so we know that was when it was constructed. And this one even had a narrower age range than the other one. This was built sometime after 1390. They built this, this, this large catchment, this reservoir, right at the very end. Because by 1450, this area is gone. You know, why would they do that? I, I do not know. But to me, it shows, again, ability to adapt to your local environment. And even if you don't have a river to tap into, you harvest water during the summertime. And it provided them an opportunity to live at that location year round. They're probably doing floodwater farming, too, in terms of crop production. So that's a neat, that's a neat uh, uh, little piece of archaeology in the Phoenix area. So in summary, um, yeah, I mean, Tucson's got some pretty cool stuff, particularly that, that age depth, 4,100 years uh, plus. You know, we may find even earlier stuff. 
uh, of agriculture. Um, but it's a Santa Cruz is a small river, so they're not large systems. Um, we only have small segments of them actually mapped and known about. Uh, but they're well preserved because they're deeply buried in the floodplains. Finding them is the challenge uh, because they are deeply buried, and the m most uh, developments aren't going to impact that deep in the floodplain, uh, so we often don't have the opportunity to, to study them. Phoenix, well, we still have over two about 2,000 years of agriculture um, and from, from what we've seen thus far, and I'm wondering if there's a geological bias there that there is earlier agriculture, or there was, but we don't see it because the dirt that age isn't there in the floodplain, because it's the nature of the Salt, salt River. I find it hard that, to believe that if you were practicing agriculture in Tucson, you know, 1000 BC, why didn't that work its way up into Salt River or the Gila River? Uh, an alternative uh, uh, idea is that maybe those rivers were too wild, the flood's too big that they couldn't manage the flood. I, 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 I doubt that, but that's also been suggested, just the hydrology, and it wasn't until later that the Hohokam figured out how to solve that problem. I don't know, it's a possibility. Um, the evidence is uh, more shallow up in Phoenix, was so more significantly disturbed, but we definitely still have the remnants of these lying beneath the city. And then both, though, have evidence of long-term desert adaptations that are based on what I call diverse strategies of water control and food production. And I think that has relevance to today. So I'm sure many of you have been reading the newspaper about the uh, DCP, the Drought Contingency Plan, uh, the idea that um, the, some of the water that we depend on, particularly from the Central Arizona Project, um, is going to be reduced uh, because of the ongoing drought that we have. And the fact that the Colorado River is over-allocated. It supports over 40 million people in several states, and it's over-allocated. Combine that with the current drought, and we've got a problem. So the state has been wheeling and dealing with different stakeholders on how we're going to deal with less water. Because the Bureau of Reclamation said there's a good chance by next year we're going to have to deal with about 500,000 acre feet less of CAP water. And here in Tucson, we use some of that CAP water. We put it in the ground and then repump it out. But it affects Tucson, it affects Phoenix, it affects the tribes, it affects farmers, particularly in Pinal County. So you may have read some of that. How are we going to, you know, that the, DC, the, the drought contingency plan solves a short-term problem, but the longer-term problem is we've got a growing population and we've got this climate change thing going on. How are we going to deal with that? And the short-term answer is we're going to have to rethink how we use water in this state, how we price that water and how we manage it. And because in Arizona, about 75% of the water that's used is used by agriculture, and yet agriculture generates mm, approximately less than 5% of the state's GDP. So when you're addressing how we're going to use water more efficiently, agriculture is going to play a big part in that, uh, you know, in terms of where and how we grow and what type of crops we grow in the desert. That's a big part of it, and then you've probably been seeing letters of the editor quite a bit about, about that. We may have to rethink uh, uh, some of that uh, strategy. So can we learn anything from some of this archaeological evidence? Well, we're not going to meet our current demands by scaling up Hohokam <laughs> canal systems. That's not going to happen. You know, during the peak of the Hohokam period, we had maybe 50,000 people living in the Phoenix uh, Lower Salt River Valley, about 50,000. Uh, it's a little more than that now. Um, so we can't just do that, but it, but taking, looking at, a, at a, a broader picture, what are some of the lessons we might learn from what the Hohokam are doing that may have contributed to their ability, and, and the people before the Hohokam, for, for thousands of years, met their ability to, to meet their food demands? You know, one is um, the fact that they used their water efficiently, and they were often growing crops that were drought tolerant, uh, not just maize, but things like um, uh, certain varieties of maize that are more drought tolerant, but uh, tepary beans and things of that sort. Uh, they would even uh, sort of semi-domesticate native plants like um, agave, uh, certainly encourage their growth by using rock piles to uh, conserve moisture in the soil underneath it, maybe even dust, nutrients. Uh, they were spreading the risk, and I think that's the lesson, is they diversified um, the types of foods they were growing and how they were growing, growing them in an effort to sort of minimize, er, to mi minimize putting your eggs all in one basket, I guess is another way of saying it. So 
diversification and spreading risk uh, and um, using water more efficiently is probably something that uh, we will need to do and something that's been done in the past, even in the, even in the face of climate change, because I'm sure these folks have had to deal with the vagaries of drought and flood over the, uh, the millennia. And it, you can take heart knowing that we've, we've learned some things from, from some of these uh, earlier far farmers and um, uh, water control managers uh, in Arizona going back thousands of years. We're now seeing places like Phoenix and Tucson encouraging rainfall harvesting, which is kind of cool. Now again, we're not going to meet all of our urban needs by rainfall cisterns and furrows and basins harvesting summer rainfall or winter rainfall, case may be. But it is going to reduce perhaps our reliance on sources like the CAP for some of our urban needs. And uh, ins institutions like Tucson Water are actually giving uh, credits and discounts to encourage people to do this. You know, this is straight out of the archaeological record. People are diversifying their sources of water. So instead of using CAP water to irrigate my uh, orange tree, um, we might be able to harvest it off the roof. Now you're going to ask me, do I have rainfall harvesting on my roof yet? No, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <coughs> so that's, that's cool. So these are kind of like what I call general lessons. You know, there are things that we can look in the past that I think were key to long-term successful agriculture uh, in Arizona. And maybe the, some of the things we're doing now don't really fit that pattern, and we're going to have to rethink those. So I'll end by saying Phoenix and Tucson, yes, they are different in so many ways. Archaeology is just one of those many ways. But there are similarities, too. And, um, and I think both communities have archaeological bragging rights. Much still to be learned, and I do think that uh, as we learn those things, it does, again, I, I say provide context for some of the problems that uh, we face today in terms of water needs and climate change. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, cons my wonder these days is when you're talking about the water shortage and um, CAP and whatnot, why do we not put a freeze on development mining and um, that sort of development? Thank you. Well, I, I think we probably know the answer to that, and, and politics has a big, a big role in that. Um, like I said, even agriculture, even though agriculture still re represents a, a small portion of the overall economy, they are, they have, they're politically, you know, pretty strong. And, and I'm not anti-farming. Um, I mean, I'm very supportive of farming, and um, but we have to, I think, rethink that. But we, they have a lot of sway. I was born and raised in Phoenix, and then let me tell you the, the, the political power of developers um, in how a city grows and, and, and how water is used. Uh, the interesting thing about development in, in terms of housing, and this is kind of an interesting statistic, you know, Maricopa County is one of the fastest growing counties in the United States over the last 20 years, and yet the total amount of water consumed in Maricopa County has gone down. And it's not so much because of water conservation, although they have worked on that. It's because an acre of cotton uses a lot more water than an acre of houses. So as some of this ag land is taken out and replaced by houses, it actually, we use less water. But nonetheless, there is a final point. You know, how many houses can we support? Uh, and then to answer your question, you know, a lot of it is, um, is politics. Um, you know, we obviously have to have agriculture. My, my point is... You know, should we be growing pecans and cotton uh, in, in the Sonoran Desert? Um, perhaps we should might be emphasizing other more drought-tolerant type crops. I have a very small, sp a specific archaeological question. Near the end of your talk, you showed what you said was a, I thought you said, a potsherd, a piece of ceramics from A.D. 1400. It didn't look like a piece of ceramics. What, what was that? Let me see if I can find that again. It's a decorated piece of pottery, no. and it looked kind of... Um, not the piece of Salado polychrome that you showed earlier. No, this no. This is the second one. Yeah, right. Okay. I, we have a ceramicist, I think, at least. No. In this, if not you, someone maybe can yeah, help somebody, me. Yeah, somebody, uh, sure. Let me go back here. 
I was told that this thing is known as a Los Muertos polychrome, if that means anything to anyone. No. No. <laughs> but it is a, it's a painted piece of pottery, and there was not just this piece, there were some others. Uh, and what is really striking to me is, I mean, it's so late in the sequence, uh, which is quite fascinating. Now, some people have wondered, are, are, is this, was this reservoir actually Hohokam? Uh, could it have been a group of what we call Salado, people who came into the area late from the east and the north, and that's who made this pottery? I, I don't know, um, but it's an interesting, interesting question, and it's very late. You know, in terms of how do we date pottery like that, it's not like I can radiocarbon date it. The fact is, is that pottery has been independently dated with something precise like tree rings uh, outside of the Phoenix area. So that's why some of these decorated ceramics and the fact that they change over a short period of time, it can give us a, a much more precise date than radiocarbon. But that's what that is. It's, um, and, and this is, I'm told by the ceramicists, they called it, it was a, a Los Muertos polychrome. Um, hello, I have an archaeological question also. Could you tell us anything about the um, use of composting, fertilizer, wastewater back in these archaeological dates? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we don't really know. In terms of compost, I would assume that they probably had a good knowledge of using natural plant material uh, to... Uh, provide nutrients, maybe provide, act as a mulch. I mean, we certainly know that ethnographically the Tohono O'odham would do that with their floodwater farming. They would actually harvest mesquite uh, leaves and stuff and actually bring them over into their fields that they were getting ready for the summer rains to plant. So if the Tohono O'odham were the probable descendants of the Hohokam were doing it, it wouldn't surprise me the Hohokam were doing it. Very hard to identify in the stratigraphic record. In terms of fertilizing, though, um, a lot of people have asked that question. You know, how can, how can you grow maize uh, repeatedly um, uh, for decades without some sort of nitrogen or phosphorus input? So many people have hypothesized that it requires external uh, input, and, and based on that, they believe that it happened. But in terms of actually identifying it, not, to my knowledge, we haven't been able to identify it. Hello. Hi. Um, you have no idea what happened to the Hohokam? I personally do Where not. they went? No. But what's interesting is it wasn't just the Hohokam. It's part of a much broader demographic change across the Southwest at that time, uh, particularly the 1300s and 1400s. A it, large region, not just the Salt River Valley and the Tucson Basin, was depopulated. Um, and for reasons, you know, there are many different hypotheses. Some are better than others. I don't think floods alone were the culprit, mm. um, but I certainly believe that if you have a convergence of bad things occurring at the same time, they can push you over the edge. Mm. So if you had um, a combination of floods and droughts and maybe um, conflict with external groups, um, maybe due to that climatic variability, and if you have um, more and more people aggregating into more concentrated communities, as what we were seeing in the classic period of the Hohokam, you perhaps are less resilient because you're not able to diversify your, your land base as much. Mm -hmm. Those things were all happening at the same time. So it, I know it's a wishy-washy answer, but to me it's a combination of social, social problems and environmental problems, but specifically, I, it, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's so many mysterious things like that. The cave-dwelling people, we don't know where they went. These people, we don't know where they went, and it's just quite a mysterious. It, it keeps us um, in, busy. <laughs> I, mean, I can't retire yet, right? So I, I, to me this is resolved. I had a question about the rock piles, and is that considered agriculture, or is it hunter-gatherer, is it something in between? And were the rock piles, did they, the use of rock piles in cultivating the agave, did that precede um, the irrigation canals? Oh, boy. Um, let's see here. Um, we've got a picture of one of those here. I... I'm not an expert on that. I, I, I saw Paul Minnis in the audience here, and I might defer to him. Uh, but 
I consider it a, I'm going the wrong direction, I apologize, a form of semi-domestication because agave is a natural crop, but it was growing in areas where it wouldn't grow naturally. They were encouraging the growth of, um, of that plant. We're just doing a whole tour of this slideshow again. I apologize. There we go. Um, this is a rock pile out near Marana, and I actually took this last month. With <laughs> Susie Fish was out there helping us with a, uh, a soils field trip, which is kind of cool. And she actually, uh, she or her students planted that in the 1980s. That's an agave murphii, uh, which was a plant that was uh, semi-domesticated by the Hoacom. But the rock piles, uh, yeah, so these things would be growing in areas that normally they would not be growing. So in a sense, they, they are being tended and cultivated. Um, I, they're not fully domesticated, but they definitely need human help to, to, to grow to where they are in these environments, at least. The rock piles are really cool because they, as I said, uh, act as a mulch. There's, there, there are greater moisture underneath those rocks. Um, they actually have greater nutrient content, and that's been sort of demonstrated by my colleague um, uh, Jeff Homburg uh, than the natural soil. Uh, so, uh, yeah, again, I call it semi-domestication. In terms of the age of these things, um, I don't know how far back in time they were doing this with agave. Um, we see... We see thermal roasting pits that date back before the Hohokam, back into the early agricultural period, you know, 2000 BC, like when agriculture starts. They may be doing agave in there, but right off the top of my head, I can't, I don't know for sure. If someone knows in the audience, please, please let the, you know, say <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> um, Gary, this is Linda. I've got a question on via Facebook, because we've got some people watching via Facebook. Okay. And this is a true question. Are there irrigation agriculture features associated with the new river north of Phoenix? Yes. Yes, Hohokam. Yeah. yeah. And um, again, I, I didn't include new, new River in there, but from the northern Phoenix Basin, you have the Alba Fria River, you have New River, you have Cave Creek. All those have uh, nicely demonstrated canal systems. They're not as big as the ones on the Salt or the Gila or the Verde. But uh, they were they're pretty sophisticated uh, irrigating uh, areas along those creeks that would only flow mainly during the summer monsoon, right? Uh, they weren't perennial back in that time. Uh, so they were just uh, diversifying uh, and uh, expanding into areas uh, where they could grow crops by floodwater farming. It's pretty cool. So we've got time for one more question. If I can get a hand up, I hear a here. <laughs> Do you have any estimates on the um, labor needed to do the Queen Creek Reservoir and, you know, relative to its size, how many people it would have uh, supported, you know, agriculture-wise? Um, yes, that has been calculated. I, I can't remember the number, but, um, I, you know, there are different approaches to try to see, figure out how many people are required to dig a canal or a reservoir of a certain size. And I forget, you know, looking at ethnographic examples where people have dug these things using basically stick and stone tools and hands and baskets, um, you know, they figure out a certain amount, like it seems like it's between one and two cubic meters of earth per person per day. That's not a lot. Uh, but nonetheless, if you have a community of 50 men, and it's probably mainly the men who are doing the, the digging and stuff because that's based on comparisons with ethnographic examples, um, you could get something like that dug in not too long a period of time uh, without a real large community. Uh, but as I said, with the canals, not only you have that upfront labor investment, but you, you have to have even more because you're, when you're cleaning it every year, because these things fill with sediment every year. Uh, you might go two years without cleaning them, but I guarantee you every two years, you've got to clean out the whole thing. So that's like rebuilding a whole new system. And then sometimes they wouldn't even, they'd say, okay, I'm just going to build a whole new one over here. Um, so to answer your question, I, I don't know specifically the answer to that, but there are people who plug in these numbers and actually come up with a, a calculation of how many people and what period of time to dig something like that. Gary, thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful job. Oh, my pleasure.